He says he'll try to be quiet. All right, ladies, continuing on with tradition number eight. Uh, we are going to start on page 562 of the fourth edition of Alcoholics Anonymous with short form. Tradition eight. Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. And the long form from page 564. Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional. We define professionalism as the occupation of counseling alcoholics for fees or higher. But we may employ alcoholics where they are going to perform those services for which we might otherwise have to engage non-alcoholics. Such special services may be well recom recompensed. But our usual AA 12-step work is never to be paid for. Mosing on to the illustrated 12 traditions and tradition 8. Spiritual as it is, AA remains very much of this world. The 8th tradition, like the 7th tradition, focuses on a vulgar five-letter word that isn't actually mentioned in either money. Many of us have had to explain to some cynical prospect, no, I am not a social worker. I don't get paid for talking with you. I'm doing it because it's the best way to stay sober myself. This does not mean, of course, that the idea of turning professional has never entered any AA's mind. In the lean years, Bill W. did think of becoming a lay therapist to earn money through his experience in helping alcoholics. But with a strong nudge from the group conscience, he soon realized he could never hang out a shingle reading, Bill W., AA Therapist, $10 an hour. It became clear to the early members that no AA should ever ask or accept payment for carrying this message to someone else, person to person, and face to face. But new questions arose as membership grew and the word of hope spread, sending thousands of alcoholics in search of AA. The first intergroups or central offices were usually manned by AA volunteers. Now, most such offices are so busy that full-time employees are needed as well. Naturally, AAs are better suited to such jobs than our non-members, but these AAs then being paid for doing 12-step work? No. In the office, they are just paving the way for this work, arranging to get a sick drunk into a hospital, telling a shaky newcomer where the nearest meeting is tonight, they are helping to make it possible for that alcoholic to hear the message person to person and face to face. A similar development has taken place at the Health Fellowship's headquarters. Once a tiny office for one co-founder, Bill, and one secretary, it has grown into the present general service office, fully staffed with a big mail room keeping the lines of communication open throughout AA Worldwide. The employees, both AA and non-alcoholic, are paid on a scale comparable to that in profit-making enterprises so that the office force can function dependably. And the AA staff members are exactly in the same position as the AA intergroup employees. Suppose you drop in at GSO one day when you're in New York. Staff members who pause to chat with you may have been working on next year's conference or corresponding with a group in your home area helping it to carry its message more effectively. For that, they are paid bi-weekly paychecks. But you may also hear them mention to other staff members plans for taking a newcomer to a meeting in the evening or for giving an AA talk to a neighborhood group the next week. For that, they are only paid with their continuing sobriety. In these office jobs and in other assignments, members are actually paid for their business and professional skills. Working at a GSO desk, on a conference-proof books or pamphlets, or on the grapevine, these AAs use their abilities as correspondents, managers, writers, editors, artists, and proofreaders, as well as their understanding of AA from the inside. 
On occasion, volunteers have given their time and talent to all these services, and their contributions are deeply appreciated. But what if the fellowship decided that all such assignments should be handled only by unpaid volunteers? In present-day AA, there's too great a volume of work to be done in spare hours here and there, and only the rich or the retired could afford to do full-time. If we tried to find in this limited group people qualified for particular tasks, obviously the field would be narrowed down, too often down to nobody at all. There would be another problem in using volunteers alone. It seems ungrateful, or at least it's socially awkward, to criticize or reject a job done for free. But paid jobs for AA get quite a going over. Take our literature, for instance, like this pamphlet. Whatever the subject, we want to be sure that each piece expresses as clearly as possible the view of the group conscience of AA as a whole. So any new project must first be approved by the conference. Once it is in process, the literature committee of the General Service Board keeps a careful eye on it at every stage. Frequently, drastic changes are required. The finished product then must be okayed both by that committee and by the conference literature committee and further revisions are often. Now wait a minute, some old timer might interrupt. What's going on here? Didn't Dr. Bob say, let's keep it simple? So lots to this step eight. Doesn't seem like it, but that was a long reading. So now let's go to the 12 and 12. Uh, to Tradition 8, which starts on page 166. First with their hand up today was Deborah. Deborah? Hi, I'm Deborah. I'm an alcoholic. Page 166. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Alcoholics Anonymous will never have a professional class. We have gained some understand, understanding of the ancient words, really ye have received, really give. We have discovered that at the point of professionalism, money and spirituality do not mix. Almost no recovery from alcoholism has ever been brought, by, brought about by the world's best professionals, whether medical or religious. We do not de decry professionalism in other fields, but we accept the sober fact that it does not work for us. Every time we have tried to professionalize our 12th step, the result has been exactly the same. Our single purpose has been defeated. Um, that is so true. Uh, yeah, I think any, we're, we're keeping uh, on reading a page, Deborah, page at a time we discuss after. Oh, thank you. The You're whole welcome. page, right? Thank yep. you. Alcohol simply will not listen to a paid 12-stepper. Almost from the beginning, we have been positive that face-to-face -face work with alcoholics who suffer could be based only on the desire to help and be helped. When an AA talks for money, whether at a meeting or to a single newcomer, it can have a very bad effect on him too. The money motive compromises him and everything he says and does for his prospect. This is always been so obvious that only a very few AAs have ever worked the 12 step for a fee. Stop there? Sure, thank you. Uh, okay. Della, go next. Della, alcoholic. Despite this certainty, it is nevertheless true that few subjects have been the cause of more contention within the fellowship than professionalism. Caretakers who swept floors, cooks who fried hamburgers, secretaries in offices, authors writing books, and all these we have seen hotly assailed because they were, as their critics angrily remarked, making money out of AA. Ignoring the fact that these labors were not false jobs at all, the critics attacked the, as AA professionals these workers of ours who were often doing thankless tasks that no one else could or would do. Even greater furrows 
were provoked when AA members began to run rest homes and farms for alcoholics, when some hired out to corporations as personal men in charge of the alcoholic problem in industry, when some became nurses on alcoholic wards, when others entered the field of ed alcohol education. In all these instances and more, it was claimed that AA knowledge and experience were being sold for money. Hence, these people, too, were professionals. At last, however, a plain line of cleavage could be seen between professionalism and non-professionalism. When we had agreed that the 12th step couldn't be sold for money, we had been wise. But when we had declared that our fellowship couldn't hire service workers, nor could any AA member carry our knowledge into other fields, we were taking the counsel of fear Fear, which today has been largely dispelled in the light of experience. Take the case of the club janitor and cook. If a club is going to function, it has to be habitable and hospitable. We tried volunteers who were quickly disenchanted with sweeping floors and brewing coffee seven days a week. They didn't just show up. Even more important, an empty club couldn't answer its telephone, but it was an open invitation a drunk on a binge who possessed a spare key. So somebody had to look after the place full time. If we hired an alcoholic, he'd receive only what we'd have to pay a non-alcoholic for the same job. The job was to do the 12th step work. It was to make 12th step work possible. It was a service position, pure and simple. Pat. Thank you, Della. Yvette. Thanks, Kimberly, that alcoholic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Neither could AA itself function without full-time workers. At the foundation, asterisk, in 1954, the name of the Alcoholic Foundation Incorporated was changed to the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous Incorporated. And the foundation office is now the General Service Office, GSO. And in our group offices, we couldn't employ non-alcoholics as secretaries. We had to have people who knew the AA pitch. But the minute we hired them, the ultra-conservative and fearful one shrilled professionalism at one period. The status of these faithful servants was almost unbearable. They weren't asked to speak at AA meetings because they were making money out of AA. <clears throat> Excuse me. At times, they were actually shunned by fellow members. Even the charitably disposed described them as a necessary evil. Committees took full advantage of this attitude to depress their salary. They could regain some measure of virtue, it was thought, if they worked for AA. Real cheap. These notions persisted for years. Then we saw that if a hardworking secretary answered the phones dozens of times a day, listened to 20 wailing wives, arranged hospitalization, and got sponsorship for 10 newcomers, and was gently diplomatic with the irate drunk who complained about the job she was doing and how she was overpaid, then such a person could surely not be called a professional AA. She was not professionalizing the 12 step. She was making it possible. She was helping to give the man coming in the door the break he ought to have. Volunteer commitment and assistance could be of great help, but they could not be expected to carry this load day in and day out. Kat. Thank you, Yvette. Pam. Hi, I'm Pam, I'm an alcoholic. Um, at the foundation, the same story repeats itself. Eight tons of books and literature per month do not package and channel themselves all over the world. Stacks of letters on every conceivable AA problem, ranging from the lonely heart Eskimo to the growing pains of thousands of groups, must be answered by people who know. Right contacts with the world outside have to be maintained. AAs, likewise, have to be tended. So we hire AA staff members. We pay them well, and they earn what they get. They are professional secretaries, but they certainly are not professional AAs. 
Perhaps the fear will always lurk in every AA heart that one day our name will be exploited by somebody for real cash. Even the suggestion of such a thing never fails to whip up a hurricane, and we have discovered that hurricanes have a way of mauling with equal severity both the just and the unjust. They are always unreasonable. No individuals have been more profited by such emotional gusts than those AAs bold enough to accept employment with outside agencies dealing with the alcohol problem. A university wanted an AA member to educate the public on alcoholism. A corporation wanted a personnel man familiar with the subject. A state drunk farm wanted a manager who could really handle in inebriates. A city wanted an experienced social worker who understood what alcohol could do to a family. A state alcohol commission wanted a paid researcher. These are only a few of the jobs which AA members as individuals have been asked to fill. Now and then, AA members have bought farms or rest homes where badly beat up topers could find needed care. The question was, and sometimes still is, are such activities to be branded as professionalism under AA tradition? Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, Marianne, could you finish us off, please? I'm Marianne, alcoholic. We think the answer is no. Members who select such full-time careers do not professionalize AA's 12th step. The road to this conclusion was long and rocky. At first, we couldn't see the real issue involved. In former days, <clears throat> the moment an AA hired out to such enterprises, he was immediately tempted to use the name Alcoholics Anonymous for publicity or money-raising purposes. Drunk farms, educational ventures, state legislatures, and commissions advertise the fact that AA members serve them. Unthinkingly, AA so employed recklessly broke anonymity to thump the tub for their pet enterprise. For this reason, some very good causes and all connected with them suffered unjust criticism from AA groups. More often than not, these onslaughts were spearheaded by the cry of professionalism. That guy is making money out of AA, yet not a single one of them had been hired to do AA's 12-step work. The violation in these instances was not professionalism at all. It was breaking anonymity. AA's sole purpose was being compromised, and the name of Alcoholics Anonymous was being misused. It is significant now that almost no AA in our fellowship breaks anonymity at the public level, that nearly all these fears have subsided. We see that we have no right or need to discourage AAs who wish to work as individuals in these wider fields. It would be actually antisocial were we to forbid them. We cannot declare AA such a close corporation that we keep our knowledge and our experience top secret. If an AA member acting as a citizen can become a better researcher, educator, personnel officer, then why not? Everybody gains and we have lost nothing. True, some of the projects to which AAs have attached themselves have been ill-conceived, but that makes not the slightest difference with the principle involved. This is the exciting welter of events which has finally cast up AA's tradition of non-professionalism. Our 12th step is never to be paid for, but those who labor in service for us are worthy of their hire. Thank you. The end. Thank you so much, Marianne. All right, I will now read the questions for thought-provoking conversation, um, and then we will open it up. Tradition 8. Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Number 1. Is my own behavior accurately described by the traditions? If not, what means changing? Two, when I chafe about any particular tradition, do I realize how it affects others? Three, do I sometimes try to get some reward, even if not money, for my personal AA efforts? Four, do I try to sound in do I try to sound in AA like an expert on alcoholism, on recovery, on medicine, on sociology, on AA itself? on psychology, on spiritual matters, or heaven help me, even on humility? 
Five, do I make an effort to understand what AA employees do? What workers in other alcoholism agencies do? Can I distinguish clearly among them? Six, in my own AA life, have I any experiences which illustrate the wisdom of this tradition? Seven, have I paid enough attention to the book 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, to the pamphlet AA Tradition, how it developed? Um, so some of these are more reflective on our knowledge of the traditions. Um, you know, I don't think they had enough questions on Tradition 8. Um, I am fortunate enough to be um, on very good friendly terms with our Tradition 8 worker here at our central office. Um, and, you know, she, she does get to attend a, a meeting that is specifically for Tradition 8 workers because the things that they deal with, obviously we can't go back to a regular AA meeting and talk about. Um, but, you know, outside of her position at our central office, you know, she does do a lot of other service work um, that is not paid. Um, and in the overtime hours she puts in, um, you know, of her own time with no pay uh, are... Our, she's pretty much on the clock 24-7, making sure our central office is always running. Like she's truly a miracle worker. Um, I've also been um, blessed to be able to meet um, two members from GSO um, who came on their own time to speak at a quarterly conference. And, you know, that that's outside of their paid responsibilities uh, of working at GSO. Um, you've heard me talk about it before. I am not a fan of people who get paid to be sobriety coaches and recovery coach coaches. I, it's my personal opinion. I think it's against Tradition 8. I do know a lot of people who have become um, addictions counselors and the like and have held positions in treatment centers. Um, I've also heard a lot of those same people share at meetings how they struggle because they thought they were doing enough with their job and they weren't doing enough on the side um, as for service. So, you know, I, I've seen people advertising their addiction coaching, sober coaching businesses for $5,000 a month to help people get sober. And, and, you know, members and owners of treatment centers that are not profit driving very expensive cars. And for me, it just... It goes against this tradition, in my opinion. That is my opinion. It, it just gives me a little, meh. Um, you know. And then I get to guys that I've heard um, make make their sponsees wash their car. You know that that goes against this as well. You know, we don't. Our big book says we don't make too hard terms for people who want the solution. And you know, making people wa wash your car or walk uphill both ways for two hours to get to a meeting. God damn, go pick them up. Um, we, you know, we don't make people jump through hoops. And so there's lots to this. I'm looking forward to this exciting discussion. Uh, let's start off with Yvette. Good morning. You have experience oh, with this. Yes. Is that alcoholic? Yes. I, um, yes. Thank you for your share. <laughs> I know so many things. I was like, <clears throat> I should probably raise my hand. Um, it's good to see everybody. And this is so great that we do this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Alive in the steps, alive in the traditions. And I'm grateful to be teachable, hopefully remain teachable, be a work in progress, and what did you say, an expert on humility? Uh-uh. <laughs> no, I thank God, right? We used to be drinking, probably, but anyway. So, yes, I became an alcohol and drug counselor, and um, I got to work in Tennessee at a hospital, and it was an honor and a privilege. But in my experience, my own personal one, I had to go to more meetings just to do that work. Yeah. And thank God for sponsors, because my sponsor was like, oh, no. You know, she taught me how to separate it. A lot of people ended up drinking. Some people ended up dying. Some people got really ill. The doctor, there were lawsuits. Let's just say bad stuff. I don't know. Everyone went crazy. And so my experience, I mean, but I did help some people. Like I had, like, I love Kim Burley's share because it was like a balance. Like somewhere in the middle is always where it is. And 
the steps balance us as an individual, the traditions as a group, and in the middle is where it's healthy, too high, too low. So, um, but with that, yeah, I'm grateful, but it had an expiration date for me. I like to say it like that. So I did six years there, and then I ended up doing, um, called to do more work. Um, Long story short, I've been able to do that, but I think for me now I'm in health and wellness, and that's kind of my roots, so it's interesting, but I'm grateful that I did it, but I'm glad that I don't do it again. My husband was like, maybe we should do a sober living, and I was like, no, 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 so, and the money is appealing. I had some coworkers that were sober coaches, and for a minute I was like, I work hard, but I was like, no, for fun and for free, I love AA, save my life. And thank God for sponsors, grand sponsors, sponsees even. Like, hey, don't we not do this? Isn't this tradition? You know, so keeping us in line. And it's for fun and for free. And then even speakers, I heard that some of them got paid. And I was was like chalk on a chalkboard. Like, you're not supposed to do that. You know, it's like ruining a beautiful gift. So I don't know. I'm one of the lucky ones that worked in the field and survived (laughs) it. But there are, you know, some people are called to do that, and they do amazing work. And I, so I don't know to balance and and thank God. I'll wrap it up real quick. But thank God that that um, the Alano Club that I went to in California when I first got sober. I, I mean, family dropped me off there. I was like crying all day. And thank God someone was there. Like, do you want a cup of coffee and you want to play? Um, cards or whatever was there and I was just like crying the whole day and I didn't drink that day and I got my 30 day chip and I held on to my sweaty little hand both of them and I didn't drink so I don't know in central office like I said they work hard there they get paid so it's a balance and I think it's about motives and checking your motives and having a sponsor to talk to about it so if you're called to do that work great if you're not that's good too for fun and for free we can't keep it unless we give it back Thanks for letting me share. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And yeah, absolutely. There is a balance, right? Because who better than to work with alcoholics, but an alcoholic and treatment centers need the work workers too. And it's just, but motive for profit or, or vow of poverty and just carry the message. But having that balance, and I love how you spoke to how it affected you and needing more meetings because that's exactly what I've heard from everybody that has ever spoken about their experience. Marianne? Hi, I'm Marianne, alcoholic. Um, a couple, a few years ago, my home group had an issue. Um, it was a recovery, like a halfway house, step down kind of facility for, for people and, re, you know, getting recovery in our area. And um, they needed meetings outside the house. So the van would come on Tuesday nights and bring the girls over to our women's meeting. And we had a general discussion group and we had a beginner's group. So they would always go to the beginner's group. And they pick up sponsors from the mem- from our members there, and you know for the however long they stayed in that halfway house. But um, one girl attempted suicide, and at the house, unrelated to and you know not present with us or anything. Well, the counselors got so frightened of letting them out the door to go to other meetings outside the building that they decided they had to come to and sit in on the meetings at our uh, meeting to hear what they shared. So they, the counselors wanted to come and sit in on the beginner's meeting with them and listen and then go back and tell the management what the girl said so they could address any potential suicide tendencies that were um, showing up. So I guess I had a fear that if one girl committed suicide, more might try. And, we, and some of our members said, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, that is that is not going to happen here. And um, and the counselors were saying, but I have a desire to stay, you know, to not drink today. I can sit in on any meeting I want to, you know. And, and some of them were in the program and acknowledged that and broke their anonymity and wanted to sit in for their own sobriety. And um, so we had to have a, a, a group conscience on it because we were – some people were being very, um, well, you know, the counselors are alcoholics. They need a meeting. Let them have a meeting with us. And the rest of us were saying that's 
we we can't. That's tradition eight. You can't you can't have them sitting in with the with in, with their count. You know, their spawned, their counselors um, at the same meeting for the purpose of taking that back to somebody else. Um, they they weren't interested in sitting in the big group. They were only interested in sitting in the beginners group where you know the girls are that they brought to the meeting. So finally, we um, we took a vote and we said no, they couldn't do it. And um, for a while, they didn't bring the girls over anymore. And then after a while, they I guess they had enough staff turnover, they forgot the whole story and they started coming back again. <laughs> but you know, I was just horrified that they would even consider using a meeting you know, for that purpose. And it's, you know, they were running a house for profit. It wasn't a nonprofit by any means. And some of their, you know, a lot of their staff had programs, some didn't. Um, I didn't think that looked particularly well for, you know, for our meeting. So anyway, but I, I, having been in this tradition group for a while, I realized that if we had thought about it, we should have called the central office and asked for some guidance, you know, and asked for somebody to, maybe come and talk with us at our, at our business meeting and help us settle it down. It might have, you know, caused a little less friction within our group. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks, Marianne. Good points that, yeah, you can always call your um, area panel and, or your central office intergroup, and they'll always send someone to help your, your business meeting. Um, you made me think of, we've got uh, girls here that they work at the harm reduction clinic. Um, and they're actually, when they're hired, even though they're in recovery, they're not allowed to bring their program of recovery. So you're not allowed to 12-step the person at the harm reduction clinic, even though you see that they're repeatedly coming in for overdose or whatever. Like, that, I wouldn't be able to do that. I wouldn't be able to do that. If I saw someone suffering, I couldn't not 12-step them. I, I, You know, but these, these girls, they talk about how I'm not allowed to 12-step at work. I'm like... Oh, that, that would just kill me. All right, got no hands up. I'm going to start picking on people. And I haven't seen Marty in a while. So, Marty, you're going. <laughs> hey, Kimberly. Hey, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I don't know that I'm the right one to pull, you know, pull from on here. It's just interesting to me. But this is really the first time I've really been looking at the, um, the eighth tradition. So, if you don't mind, I'm just going to listen more to what all y'all are saying. But Not at all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to see you again. All right. Let's pop on up. Sandy has a look like, call on me, don't call on me. Sandy, would you like to share? Yeah. Just hit your unmute. Hi. I'm Sandy, alcoholic. Um, you guys, I have voice trouble, so I apologize. Um, it's hard for me to talk. So I'm not going to volunteer to read or anything. But yeah, this is my first time to your meeting. Um, so thanks for letting me attend. Thank you so much, Sandy. I'm glad you're here. Um, and we're going to be starting... Uh, from the beginning of the big book again, what, in a week, on the 21st, right? In one, yeah, Monday the 21st, we're starting from the beginning again. So hope you, hopefully you stick around. Della, Della, Della. <laughs> Della Alcoholic. Good morning, ladies. So there's a guy in um, my home group, and uh, he's a comedian. And he does. He gets paid for his appearances at, say, roundups or conferences or that sort of thing. Um, is that a special worker? Like, would you consider that a special worker? Or like, is he going against Tradition 8? Is he being paid to be the entertainment, say, where they, wouldn't, they would be paying a DJ? Yeah, I guess. Then that, I don't think, is wrong. Okay. If, if he's being paid as the entertainment. Yeah. If he's a speaker, like what, what was being shared about speakers, you know, when you're traveling as a speaker, you should be traveling as cheap as possible and trying to save the fun. I've also heard that too. Yeah, that whereas I've heard of, of people that are like, are like yeah, um, put me up in the best hotel. In the best hotel. I want, 
my meals covered, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. See, for that, I'm like, Man, I owe enough financial amends to the universe that I pay my own way, right? Like, right. <laughs> Okay. No, I'm just but curious. yeah, I, if they were going to be hiring a DJ or a band or something like that, I think being paid as an entertainer is a little different than being paid as a speaker. Right. Okay. But well, yeah. Thank you. Connie will be after Marianne. Okay, love. Marianne had her hand up and then I'll come to you. I just didn't want you waving at me for five minutes. Hi, I'm Mary Ann. I'm an alcoholic. Um, you know, we have a, a gentleman in my home group here, and he is a psychotherapist. You know, but when, and he gets paid. And he graciously will, if somebody has a problem, he will see them in his home. Um, people from the program, but he does not charge people in the program. So um, I think that's uh, what we're talking about here, that he's not getting paid. Um, he has helped me in the past, and I believe that is okay in the program. So you can let me know what you think. Oh, absolutely. That's like... Not the same, but similar. It's like, yeah, I have a business in which I make money off of selling T-shirts to people in recovery. But I don't promote it at a, at a meeting, right? But if I'm wearing something or somebody knows and asks me a question, I'll talk about it. So if this man is a psychotherapist, you know, and obviously he wants to help other alcoholics if he's part of our fellowship, then as long as he's not standing up in meetings and being like, if you need a free session, I'll... Uh, help you and then what four free sessions in he's charging your extended health or something he's not trolling for businesses it sounds more like he's trying to be helpful in in getting people to to recover so for me I don't think that's wrong but you know what this is AA and there's you know a gazillion opinions so someone else might find a problem with it but for me I don't think that's I don't think that there's anything wrong with that at all he would be interesting to listen to share is what I think. All right, Connie. Hi, I'm Connie. I'm an alcoholic, and um, I've gone to a lot of uh, roundups and, and all that over the years. And from what I understand is um, the speakers don't necessarily get paid. However, don't they, they pay for their flight, their food, and hotel, right? Yeah. And that's okay. I mean, because I do feel like, because I know they said that, you know, they have to have so much money in the group to cover that. Um, but do they have a limit on it or anything? Or? Well, you would think that the organizers would want to be as cost effective as possible because anything over and above from ticket sales usually gets donated back to levels of service. Um, but everybody's autonomous and can do whatever they want. Um and it just depends on the speaker, right? Like, for, right. for me personally, I would try to make it into a business trip to make it so it's at least expenses possible. You know, even when I travel as a GSR, you know, I, I do, I'm a bit of a princess, but I will charge my, my, my home group only a portion of my room because I know I'm upgrading my room. Well, that's good. Okay. You, well, one of the issues this is when you were talking about, um, you know, professions is, you know, like I don't think you should talk about your profession. However, if people come up and talk to you about it, I mean, like you say if you provide a service that's out of AA and somebody comes and talks and you're not promoting it, but somebody asks you about it, that's okay, is it not? A hundred percent. What you talk about before the meeting, during the smoke break, and after the meeting is a hundred percent okay. Is, yeah. you know, going up to the podium and talking about it, a little bit terrible, right? Right. Um, yeah, but like we're talking professionalism with um, Tradition 8, I'm an accountant. So say GSO needed an accountant, I could put my name in the hat for that. Um, but um, you can also see in the the newsletter that comes up, what's it called? 
been nine four something or other. I'm terrible with these things. Four four five nine. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Four, five, nine, bit something. There's a lettered newsletter, and you'll see ads in there for positions. Um, and sometimes it'll be a non-member position, and they advertise, and they look for trustees sometimes too. They'll be like, "We're looking for a trustee that is a lawyer or whatever, um, uh, or a whatever." I've always seen them in that thing. My memory is partially good, <laughs> um, so they're they're always looking for workers in different vocations, right? So if you if you had been a receptionist for your whole life and GSO needed a receptionist, you 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 could potentially do that. I do agree. One other thing I wanted to say is what um the other girls are that worked in um you know for a, a sober place or whatever that we have a lot of people that are hired to, you know, work at a place, a recovery place, and I do find that they do need extra meetings because it does bring on a lot of stress because, you know, if somebody dies and overdoses, I mean, like you say, it's going to affect them. Well, and if you think about the the the, um, the atmosphere, you're, you're sitting in pre-step one and step one, maybe step two and three all day. You're never actually... Complete because usually after step four they're gone from the treatment center if if even that and usually you're not the one helping them with that it's just it's really like basic stuff over and over and over again so you're get get caught up in the chaos super super easy too thanks Connie. Uh, Joanne. Whoops. Damn mute button. I didn't touch it. It was me. Hi. I'm Joanne and I'm an alcoholic addict. And Mary, sometimes some of us stay a little bit late after the meeting. Um, and you can, uh, ex we can exchange some numbers. Um, I was a little late, but I got the gist of the tradition and what's going on. And, and, as I sit and I listen, I think to myself, if, you know, we ask our higher power for care and protection, and we have to do that with our meetings, and we have to do that with our service and our traditions. And there's a man in one of my groups that talks about the hula hoop. You put the hula hoop on, and there's only so much control you have. And then once it's past the hula hoop, it's out of your control. And so... Yes, we have people coming in from other uh, treatment programs and everything. I protect AA in the meetings. I don't want to hear about your program in my meeting, but if you're choosing your counselor to talk about that, that, you know, my husband has a saying that I really like. He goes, life is self-flushing. If they're going to do that, they might destroy their program. I don't know. That's their program. But you can't bring your program into my program. You're all at an open meeting. Everybody's welcome. But this is our program, and we protect our program through our traditions and, and standing up for ourselves so we don't get involved in politics and religion and outside organizations. We just don't. The other thing, um, it was really important, I was going to say, um, Nope, I lost it. Um, no, it, it went away. Um, but, you know, if it dawns on me and there's time, I'll, I'll cue again. But, um, you know, it's just, oh, the speakers, that's what it was. So I was involved with the International Conference of Young People in AA. And we budget to bring in I mean, we do a search. And we also, within AA, 
and young people's, we're connected to service. We even have a service board for young people. And so we're always checking, always checking. And there are amazing speakers. And it's okay to bring them in. And it's okay to put it on the budget, their transportation, and everything is part of operating expense. And when we're done with the conference, money goes to service. So I have no problem. The part that I tweak and I'm powerless over because it's not my organization is some of these spiritual retreats where everyone's AA, people are benefiting from it, but it's not AA, but everybody that's going is AA. So it's really, you know, if, if we, well, that's the, but you know what? I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about it. And getting back to the care and protection, um, we are a level field. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor, I'm a child care provider, um, you're a mom, you know, he's a lawyer, you know, sometimes there are some special meetings, but generally when you're in a meeting, we don't bring our profession in. And even if you're not at the podium, if the only re if if the word gets out, oh, he's the psychotherapist. Somewhere along the line, the line is being blurred because I work in childcare, and if a parent meets me, loves who I am, loves how I interact with their child, there's always been a controversy. If they ask me to be a nanny for the summer. The only reference that's connected is that business. And if something happens, they're like, well, that business did the background check. That business referred. So it gets convoluted. So all I'm saying is when you when you imply, apply these traditions, just take a deep breath and say, am I taking care and am I protecting my meeting and am I protecting AA and am I protecting the newcomer especially. And when in doubt, ask up. You know? And so that's that's what I wanted to share on it. Thank you so much, Joanne. Y you know, I know exactly what you're saying about those retreats. I, I personally, I'm going on a spiritual yoga retreat to Greece, but it's all AA girls that are going, but it's another member's business. So it's fully separate. But I've been on committees for like a girls 12 step weekend and I had to leave the committee because it was for profit for the lady who was organizing it and I'm like if you're doing steps there shouldn't be a profit at the end of the this retreat and I was like I'm out um that that kind of stuff anything left over should go to service in my opinion um so yeah but there we go opinions are varied but I yeah uh, I'm excited to go to the Bali trip with Grace. <laughs> um, anybody else? We got six minutes left. Anybody have questions? Della. So let's say they have a roundup or a retreat and they need first aid. Now, would I, so if I didn't do any step work, if I didn't do any 12 step work, if I didn't talk about my program, could it potentially be employed because of my, my guilt? Yes. Because okay. if they, if they are required That's by health code, right? If they're right. required by health code or whatever to have two first staters on site, yeah. Then, then they're going to have to pay for two first staters. So why wouldn't they say, Della will pay you to do it since you're an AA or and a first stater? So it's just picking picking what hat you're going to wear. That's right. You wouldn't you wouldn't function. be giving CPR and reviving someone saying, you know, we really should get into the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous when you start breathing again. You're right. there with okay. your first yeah. aid hat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Right? Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Shall we close with our serenity prayer and then have some fellowship time? 